This is a real familiar pas- passage, but I want to hopefully look at it a little differently. It says, Write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. This is a message from the one who is Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear, listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Father God, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us this morning. That we would receive from you, we would hear your voice. Not only, Father, would we hear your voice, but we would be changed by it. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this is one of, one of the, uh, the, the letters to the seven churches of uh, the New Testament. Laodicea is one of those weird cities, okay? Um, you you got to know the history, for all of you who hate history, sorry. You've got to know the history for this passage to make sense. Laodicea was an incredibly wealthy city, um, I can't think of a city in the world today that would equal its wealth. Um, It was so wealthy that years before this was written, there was an earthquake that destroyed the city. Okay? Um, It was part of Rome, and Rome said, hey, we'll come in and we'll help you rebuild your city. And they said, no thanks, we got it. There there you go. Talk about not taking government subsidies. Laodicea Laodicea was one of the first. You know, think about that. You know, we just had the tragedy of Sandy last year, you know, destroyed New York and uh, New Jersey. What was the first thing people wanted? Money. They wanted the government to fix their problems. They wanted the government. Laodicea, an earthquake destroyed the city, and they said, no thanks, we, we got it. We have enough money. We'll take care of this ourselves. And by the way, they did. They had the money. So... So think of a very, very wealthy, very influential, very, very independent. Very independent. And in that dependent, they they had three, two major areas of income. One was they were a pharmaceutical city. They made medicines. And their, their biggest seller was an eye ointment. They sold an eye ointment all over the world, made lots of money. Number two thing that they sold was um, textiles. And they had the brightest, whitest of all. And they, they were known for their stark white material. Okay, So when you read this, you've you got to understand that, that the Holy Spirit is going after the things that make this city what it really is. And you've got to understand that where, wherever a church is planted, it takes on some of the characteristics of the people who make it up. And you can see that throughout the Old Testament. You, you can't escape it. When you read First and Second Corinthians, and, and you take a, a critical look at it, you go, wow, those people were screwed up. There, there was so much ungodliness happening in, in Corinth um, that it infected the church. And Paul writes those two letters trying to cure the infection. Um, Corinth was the most ungodly city in the world of its time. It was an absolute insult to be called a Corinthian. 
Las Vegas on steroids is the way I like to look at it. I mean, they were that evil. And they loved it. So when Paul plants a church in Corinth, he's taking people from that culture and teaching them to live for God. And it infected, their culture infected the church and Paul had to go back and do maintenance on getting that stuff out of the church. Well, Laodicea is the same. There was a church planted in Laodicea and the people who made up the church were very wealthy, arrogant people. And the Holy Spirit is trying to get to them. Um, I love that, the, you know, the, the, the story goes that, uh, you know, when it talks about lukewarm money, and I've heard so many evangelists misuse this passage, it drives me crazy, you know. He says, you're hot or cold, and you know, if you're hot, you love Jesus. If you're cold, you don't love Jesus. It, that is not what this is talking about at all. And what I want to talk to you about this morning throughout this is usefulness. The Laodiceans were, were so wealthy that miles from them, there were two areas one in the mountains one in the things and one had hot springs and the other one had cold springs and they were like wow that's really cool we would really like hot and cold running water in in Laodicea so they built aqueducts spent lots of money um, they built aqueducts to bring the cold water in and to bring the hot water in um, what they never planned on was the distance that traveled what happens to cold water when it travels Long distances in warm weather, it becomes lukewarm. And what happens to hot water when it travels long distance? It becomes lukewarm. And here they spent all this money on these aqueducts and had all of this water coming into the city that was absolutely useless. Nobody wants it. You don't want to drink in it. You don't want to bathe in it. You, you know, it, it just... They spent all this money for nothing. Okay? So what Jesus is trying to get across here is usefulness. How do we as believers and leaders make ourselves the most useful? Now, hear me. There is nothing wrong with the lifestyle in which the Laodiceans had. I mean, it wasn't wrong for them to make medicine or to do textiles or to be wealthy. There's nothing wrong with those things. The issue was, is they had, become, they had come to depend on it. You ever heard the, the saying, your greatest strength is your greatest weakness? It, it, that is so incredibly true, and that's what happened with the Laodiceans. They were good at making money. They were good at being business people, um, but they had come to trust in themselves. You know, they, they told Rome, no thanks. We can do it. And they did. And, and it infected the church. The church became the same way. They, they were like, God, we're good. We, we really don't need anything from you. The moment we get to the place where we don't think we need something from God, and probably a lot of some things, we are in huge spiritual trouble. Um, they believed that they were wealthy and that they could see the world as it really was. And God is saying, not a chance. You, you don't know my heart. You don't understand my heart. Because you are depending on your strength, you're missing what I'm trying to do. Um, another great example of this is, is Paul. Think about Paul who planted churches all over the known world, was, wrote Half the New Testament, you know, you don't get much better than Paul. The thing that Paul learned very early on was not to trust in his own personal skills. And I can't imagine how hard that lesson was for Paul because the Bible tells us that Paul, as a young man, way beyond his years, became a Pharisee. I, you know, that would be like a 30-year-old pope, you know, in, in our world. Think about that for a second. Um, you know, the popes that are elected are old. I'm sorry, they are. And, and there's reasons for that, but they're all political. But at a very young age, Paul got to the pinnacle of his profession. 
And he did it on his own talents because he was incredibly smart, well-educated. Um, he was, uh, he was a, a great arguer. Actually, that's what his degree was in. His, his degree was in rhetoric. Um, and, and we would call that a lawyer. Basically, he had a, a, a law degree at a very young age. And he could convince you of things with his words. And he was really good at it. Really good. He was so good at it that he got people to kill other people. Paul says it. Read, read it in Acts and several other places. He, he was so good at doing what he did, he, he, could, he could whip up a crowd and they would go out and they'd kill people. And he'd stand by and give the thumbs up. Okay? When he got saved, he stopped. When you, read, when you read how Paul approaches ministry after his salvation, it's totally, totally on God's terms. Um, he, he even says, I don't use fancy words or, or human arguments. Now, those fancy words and human arguments had got him to the pinnacle of his career. I mean, he, there was really no place other than, you know, like chief priest, I guess there was no place for Paul to go in the Jewish world. He was, he was there. He was at the top. And when he becomes a Christian, he takes his greatest strength and he sets it aside. And he says, God, what do you want, what do you want to do in me? That's, that's who I am. Who do you want me to be? And, and in Laodicea, the Holy Spirit is asking them to do the same thing. Take your greatest strength. Recognize it. Understand it. Use it when you need it. But you've got to depend on me, on Christ. And, and as we walk... And, and figure out where we're supposed to be at in the kingdom of God. The big thing for us is to put me aside and ask God, who do you want me to be? How do you, you know, God created you. So, so let me go back here for a second. God created you, and he created you with your skill and talent set. All right? He created you that way. So those aren't curses. Paul's ability to argue wasn't a curse. By the way, um, Paul used his ability to argue, but he used, instead of using man's arguments, he used God's arguments, which, by the way, are way better. And that's how he led people to Christ. He still used his ability to persuade, which was really good. He used it, but he used it in a godly manner. He took that thing that, that really was a curse. He was so good at it that he, he was killing people with it. And he turns it into something that God can use and still uses. So whatever your gift or talent is, whatever those things that God has put in you, they're there for a reason. You just have to make sure they're submitted to the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's really tough because sometimes the Holy Spirit tells you you're not allowed to use that. The Holy Spirit says, no, you're, you're, you're not going to do this on your own. You're going to have to let me do this. And one of the reasons there is because God doesn't share well. Honestly, you know, He doesn't play nice with others. He, he's not going to share His glory with anybody. He'll let you be promoted as long as you're giving him credit for the promotion. And he'll let you use your gifts as long as you're giving him the glory for those gifts. When you start taking that glory for your own, you're going to get a letter something like this. And he's going to say, no, that's not the way this works. So as as we lead ourselves and as, as we lead others, one of the things we have to make sure we're doing is that we're hearing from God 
and that whatever our gifts and talents are, whatever our strengths are, that they are being submitted to Christ. So, um, Aaron, I've known Aaron forever. Aaron is an incredible musician, okay? The day he gets on stage saying, I don't need the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me, is the day he starts to lose his gift and talent. Okay? Um, does Aaron still have to work at it and perfect his craft? Absolutely. But the day he takes credit for his talent, he's done. Um, you know, wh- whatever that is, if you're a great administrator, if you're a great encourager, um, whatever it is, if, if you're incredibly mechanically inclined, you're, you know, you look at things and you just know how they work. Those things were put there to be used for the kingdom of God, but it's, it's again, it's all where is it submitted to? What, what are you doing to give God the glory for what He has put in you? And, and what happened in Laodicea is they came to Christ, they said yes to God, and, and then they went about living their life like nothing happened. They just continued to do what they were doing. They depended on their own things, you know, Maybe you're, maybe you're really good with street smarts. You know? You've met those people. They, they, just, they, know, they look at a situation and they can always turn that situation to their good. Okay, first off, understand that's a gift from God. The question is, is what are you using it for? What are you using it for? Are you going to use it for the glory of God or are you going to use it for your gain? He goes on, and after he, he says, first off, um, I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Sometimes our talent makes us indifferent to the Holy Spirit. I can get by. I can get by. You know, some of you are, are incredibly personable people. You know, you just have one of those personalities that people just, you meet them and everybody thinks you're their best friend. And so you become indifferent to working at friendships. Because for you, friendships are disposable. If that one doesn't work out, I'll just smile at somebody else and they'll be my best friend. Our talent can make us indifferent. But God always wants to discipline us to, and, and reel that thing in so that we use it for His glory. And then listen, He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Uh, again, this is an- another one people love to say, you, know, you need to come to Jesus. He's standing at the door. Understand, He's talking to believers here. He is talking to the church. And, and it goes back to that indifference. As we, The more we trust or the more we depend on our gifts and our strengths, the further we get from Christ. And and because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, He's not going to force Himself on you. He's going to knock, but it's up to you whether you're going to answer the door or not. Are you going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Are you going to allow the Holy Spirit um, in so that you can be changed the way God wants you to change. And, and this is a struggle for all of us. This is for, from the, you know, the guy who just got saved yesterday to somebody who's been saved 30, 40 years. It's still the same struggle because the reset button is always reset to you. I.e., you know, when, when life is out of control for me, I fall back on the things that I am most familiar with. And whatever that is, it usually has to do with my God-given gifts and talents. It's where I'll, you, you, just, you, you go back to what you know, right? And unless you allow God to change what you know and where that reset button resets to, you always go back to it. And, and that has to do with I'm going to use whatever it is that you have to get me out of this jam. Whatever that gift or talent is. Um, The question is, is, are you going to listen to the Holy Spirit? Are you going to listen? You know, when when you're in that place where you're pushed in the corner, and it it happens to all of us, 
whether it's a deadline that has to be met, there's a relationship that's going south, um, a new job, whatever. We, we always we go back to who we are at the core of our being. The only way that gets changed is through the Holy Spirit. The only way that we, we are a different person when the reset button is hit is if the Holy Spirit has had time to work on us. And, and that's what Christ is talking about when he says, you know, if you answer the door, I'll come in and we'll have a meal together as friends. When Christ truly becomes your friend, you look at the world differently. Um, if you have a best friend or had a best friend, how do you know that they were a good friend? How do you know that they, they, they were a true friend? Isn't it because you are changed by your relationship with them? I married Mary because she changed who I was. And I liked it. And as, as we grow together, I am a different person because I am with her. And any true friend changes you. Not always for the good. <laughs> Sorry. Some of our best friends are our worst enemies. So if, if, it, if we're changed by a relationship, if we're changing, we get that relationship by being friends with Christ. And the, the, the more we draw close to Him and the more we allow Him to be our friend, we're changed so that when we, we need to hit the reset button, when life is out of control and we need to get back to who we are at the core of our being so that we can move forward, the only way we don't go back to the base, ungodly person is by spending time with Christ before, I mean, before the reset button has to be hit. Just, just because you have a relationship with Christ doesn't mean that your life isn't going to get out of control. I don't know of a believer who doesn't get out of control from time to time. And you get to a place where you say, okay, I, I need to reset. I need to... The question is, is where are you going to reset to? Are you going to be useful or useless? The only way you reset to useful is if Christ has worked in your life. What the Holy Spirit is condemning or correcting in the Laodiceans is uselessness. They're not useful. I, I don't know about you, but for me, the most annoying personality is the one who says, I don't need anything from anybody. The overly needy one is a, a close second <laughs> for me. But that personality who says, I don't, I, don't, I don't need your friendship, I don't need your help, I don't need, I don't need, I don't need. Because they've got it all together. Understand that the Holy Spirit said, yeah, you, you folks are really wealthy. You've got all this stuff, but you don't understand who you truly are. You're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. And in that condition, you cannot do anything for the kingdom of God. If you'll receive from me, I'll make you useful. As believers... We have got to be useful in the kingdom of God. And we can only be useful if we are depending on the Holy Spirit to take our gifts and our talents and put them in the right places and aim them in the right direction. Father God, I just thank you and praise you for your word. I thank you for our time together here. Lord, I ask that you would just help each of us um, Take this word, hear your voice, and apply it to our lives that you might be glorified and honored.
Father, we thank you and praise you for this time together, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen.